It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Today we have Jameson Fink joining us from Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Welcome to the show, Jameson. Hi, it's great to be here. It's great to have you. Oh my gosh. And for those of you that don't know, Jameson Fink has actually worked for Wine Enthusiast, MSN.com, Grape Collective, and The Foodista, and his eponymous blog is Wine Without Worry. He's a two-time finalist for a Severe Blog Award, and Jameson is somewhat of a pariah for his unwavering defense of the champagne flute, and we're going to talk about that. But he's also on the eternal search for bars and restaurants that aren't too loud. It's true. I'm a cranky old man. I just I, I like to go to places early when they're not crowded or um, at weird hours or I just it's like going to a big rock concert now. Like I just couldn't handle it. I'm just uh, that part of my life is over. I don't know if that sounds defeatist or lame, but it's who I am. I don't think I don't think that sounds uh, defeatist at all, but I also think it sounds a lot like Val. <laughs> it does. You kids get off my lawn. Yeah, Val, Val, we could definitely go out to dinner and we'd be like, let's go somewhere at five o'clock that's not crowded. Exactly. We'd get along really well. <laughs> totally. I'm totally that. Steph, when was the last time you heard of me going to a concert? I know. Val's like, crowds? No, thank you. <laughs> The last concert I went to, my mom lives in Reno, and I went and saw uh, Dwight Yoakam, who was great. Love him. But the best thing about it was everyone um, sat down. There was, like, ample bathrooms really close by and, like, three or four bars. So I was like, that is, like, the ideal concert. Yeah, I went and saw, I think, Straight No Chaser, and I had two women sitting behind me screaming like they were at a a Backstreet Boys concert. And I'm like, Mm. really? It's Straight No Chaser. Yeah, I that. love straight no chaser. I know, though. <laughs> but totally ruined the concert for us because of the screaming. I mean, it was just awful. I'm like, who does that? It's straight no chaser. But anyway, speaking of straight no chaser, we should probably get into our day drinking, right? Yes. Yeah, let's start some day drinking. Or Jameson's already been drinking. But anyway, <laughs> we're well, catching up. T- tasting, of course. There is a difference. Tasting. Well, what what are you sipping on right there now? There was some drinking, of course. <laughs> Well, I'm drinking a um, a rosé. It's been since last year when I discovered this wine. Not like I, you know, I found it, but uh, when it was a discovery for me. It's a, uh, well, I love one liter wines. I love anything that comes in a liter bottle. Just it's nice to get a third extra, you know, bottle of wine in your bottle. But it's a uh, rosé from Italy. It's all Pinot Noir and it's this brand called, uh, yeah, um, Mille wines is in like a thousand uh-huh. M-I-L-L-E wines. So all their wines are, spoiler alert, in a one liter bottle, screw cap. And this is like a super pale Pinot Noir rosé. It's super easy drinking. I got it at my wine shop that's uh, stone throw away from me, Great Point Wines. And it's uh, 16 bucks for a liter of dry, refreshing rosé. So uh, I'm, uh, I've been very happy with it and buying it frequently. How about you two? Now, first of all, that sounds awesome. $16 for a liter bottle of wine. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. great. I'm really happy with it. I love that. And I actually, Steph, you're going to love this. I am drinking the White Cliff Vineyard Vidal Blanc from the Hudson River re- region. Oh. Oh. Did we, is that Coravond? Is that what? The cork was originally violated back in December. <laughs> violated, right. With I know. <laughs> Coravond. We were, we, were, we were tasting New York wines, and this has been in my fridge under the magic of Coravan ever since, and oh. you cannot flippin' tell. That's cool. There is no oxidation. The fruit is still there. The acid is still there. I was shocked, I, and I was just like, props to the Coravan. It's been almost six months. And so, yeah, this is a Vidal Blanc. Those of you that heard our Ice Wine episode might have heard us talk about this grape. It's a French hybrid, and it's a great summer wine, decent, decent alcohol, 12%. So not too alcoholic, lots of fruit, lots of acid, very simple, easy drinking, and I would say porch pounder. Nice. That's, I think what's just cool about it is that you what you use it with, you know, that's, I'm so excited for you. I still don't have one of those. Do you, do you sport a Coravon, Jameson? I don't, but uh, a couple years ago, I interviewed Greg on uh, my show, and he had like a, a Barolo and a white Burgundy, and... Uh, you know, like it would, they had open, been open for six months and these master psalms and masters of wine had signed it, you know, so just you 
you know, there was no shenanigans about it. Yeah. And I was, I was floored by it. I mean, it's like, a, it's a pretty incredible invention. I mean, I was a believer. It's uh, it's definitely, I mean, even if, you know, it ain't cheap, but even if something, if you drink a lot of even like 10 to $15 bottles of wine, at some point it's going to pay for itself because you're never dumping things down the drain. Or you can buy like two or three bottles at a time and like kind of like sample a few and, uh, you know, come back to it later, you know, like the Vidal Blanc. Yeah. Right. And it's, you know, you've got to have a real cork and I know they've got their attachments now. And it's funny because they were using the Barolo at the Society Wine Educators Conference the year they were there, Steph. I don't know if you remember that the first year we went. Oh, no, I don't think I ever went to the booth for some reason. Yeah, he had a Barolo that had been open for, I think, like eight months or something. And I tried it. And that's when it got on my radar. But it wasn't until the diploma when I was opening eight, 10, 16 bottles at a time where I was like, all right. It's it's it already paid for itself. I mean, yeah. so if you open a lot of bottles or if you do a lot of more expensive bottles with real cork, it does make sense for some people. But that said, I have my Barolo for tomorrow under the uh, Repor. Yeah. So we'll see how that worked for that. So that's a whole different system that uh, we've talked about a little bit before. So, yes. Yeah. Well, on to what I'm actually drinking is something that Jameson has written about before Whoa. and... Yeah, when I was Googling this bottle, your blog from May of 2016 came up. This is the Lou D. Melon from oh, Santa yeah. Maria Valley. Nice. Yeah, you remember that one? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's a great bottle. I, I, I enjoyed that immensely. I remember I was drinking it in a uh, Manhattan apartment that was like 100 degrees with no air conditioning and <laughs> oh, uh, hot, white hot light blazing down on me. So it was a well-deserved and enjoyed wine. Yeah. I, you know, I just um, discovered this one through my local purveyor and he said, Hey, I think you should take this home with you. You'd really like it. It is a little bit pricey at $22 a bottle, but not too bad, actually. I mean, it's really a beautiful wine and it's nice as an aperitif, but it also would go very nice with oysters or mm. any kind of shellfish. And uh, there's oysters actually on the label. So it's like, yes. a, you know, a, clue it's a charming label. Of, <laughs> it is. It's really simple. And, um, I like it. I like it a lot. Nice wine. Um, and for anybody who's not sure what melon is, that would be uh, when when you've heard of Muscadet from the Loire Valley, that is the Santa Barbara equivalent right here in my glass. It's funny because when I think of oysters, I think of Muscadet. But Jameson has just come from an oyster luncheon, an oyster and Chablis lunch, I should say. So first of all, uh, Jameson, thanks for uh, hanging in there and taking one for the team. I'm sorry you had to endure such a thing. I did it for the podcast. I did it for you, uh, We too. appreciate it. We appreciate it. But since we've already done a kind of a hardcore grape gab about Chardonnay sure. a while back, we kind of wanted to focus a little bit in and on the uh, the Chardonnay chatter, kind of freshen it up a bit, and maybe look at Chablis, Chablis and oysters, and just let you drop some 411 on what makes us an iconic pairing or anything else that you discovered at this luncheon today. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll talk about oysters for a little bit. So um, it was uh, William Fev Chablis, a great producer. They had all kinds of uh, fancy wines and uh, Grand Cru's and a couple and an older vintage. But so the oyster expert was Rowan Jacobson, and he wrote a book called A Geography of Oysters. And so I learned a couple interesting things about oysters. One is that like how to eat an oyster is that you got to you're supposed to chew the oyster, not just kind of like, you know, slurp it down in one bite, because as he says, it exposes some of its flavors, like it's more umami flavors in the sweetness of the oyster, and you get more than just that kind of brininess to it. So I thought that was interesting. And then, you know, when we think of oysters, we think of the classic wines like Muscadet or, you know, like a Sauvignon Blanc, like a really racy, high acid wine. And what he said is that with some uh, varieties of oysters that it can actually make um, uh, the oyster taste metallic. So for some oysters, certain uh, types of oysters, um, that you actually want to avoid a wine like that. So that's what he was saying, why Chablis can be a really great oyster wine. I mean, of course, it is one of the most iconic oyster wines, but that it, some of them have a little extra richness to balance that acidity out, and they're not screamingly acidic like, say, a Sauvignon Blanc or a Muscadet, and that little bit of extra richness, um, it makes a better pairing for an oyster than any sort of, you know, like rip and acid uh, wine, which I thought was uh, 
a really interesting point too. Is so you're not in that muscadet rut with oysters or something like Sauvignon Blanc wines that I love, but it's just sort of like I guess you know oysters are just like wine that there's different varieties from different places and that have different flavors and you know people like to say you know like terroir marowar haha but um, but there's <laughs> there is a, I, I hate saying that word but you know there is a, a something to it so to me that was something really interesting about about Chablis and then I guess just what I also would say about Chablis is uh, you know Chardonnay is such a polarizing grape people either love it or hate it you know that ABC anything but Chardonnay and I think I think people still to this day get burned by those super oaky buttery Chardonnays and what's great about Chablis and especially a producer like Feb is like a lot of the wines are there's no oak and then they only use um for like their their higher end wines uh used oak so I think like oak is such a great tool for Chardonnay it's just that it you know when you use used oak you don't get those like toasty flavors but you get kind of a roundness and a richness to it and texture which i think uh oak is you know gets kind of a bad rap for just being um, a one note you know like clumsy tool but yeah when you use like 100 percent new oak that's gonna um impact the wine in a, in a powerful way but if you use a uh, neutral oak you know oak that's been you know around the block a few times and been used like it's really um much i think friendlier towards uh wine and grapes especially like chardonnay so did you guys have a, a sampling of like a, a Grand Cru versus a Petit Chablis versus a different grades of Chablis or different types or how many Chablis were there? Yeah, there were six. And we started with, uh, you know, like a village level, you know, quote unquote, regular Chablis. And then we had, um, luckily, I have my uh, notes right in front of me. We had All uh, right. two uh, Premier Cru's, two Grand Cru's, and then one um, Grand Cru from 2009, which was um, fascinating and, and kind of was like uh, each oyster was paired uh, like Rowan paired each oyster with each wine based on like this is like a leaner racier Chablis we're going to pair it with a you know a Hama Hama oyster but with like the you know a Grand Cru d- demand sort of a different oyster so yeah we went we, we rolled really deep into um not just like these are great oyster wines but, like this specific oyster goes with this wine so like I mean you don't have to lose your mind over stuff like that but it's definitely you know kind of fascinating to get to sample six different oysters with an oyster expert. And then, of course, you know, a Chablis expert as well. Was there one uh, specific oyster that really, like, knocked your socks off and with the wine? Yeah, I think it was the the second one. It's, uh, I think it's a Duxbury Gem, I think is the name. I'd have to look that up further. But it's a it's an East Coast oyster. And I lived in Seattle for 10 years. I'm just, I'm used to more of um, the West Coast one. So that's kind of an interesting uh juxtaposition but um they were all really good i guess what the most surprising one would be is drinking um a 2009 chablis and that was with a wellfleet uh oyster is that you know when you think about oyster wine you think about like super fresh like young wines like i would never think about drinking an older and this wine was like pristine i mean it was you know nine years old but it was fresh as a daisy but you know you never think about i wouldn't think about if I was ordering a dozen oysters, I wouldn't think like, yeah, I'd love to have a white wine from 2009. I'd be like, no way. I got to get out of here. These people are. Yeah, crazy. I would think the same thing. But uh, but it was really good. I mean, that's just I mean, it's it's a it's not like a, you know, this a 2009, you know, like, you know, two buck Chuck Chardonnay. It's like something like, you know, like a killer Grand Cru wine that, you know, is going to age slowly and majestically. But that was that was pretty interesting. You know, I always think of, I don't know my oysters, so listeners, you've just had an Oysters 101 with Chablis, but I always think of whatever they're serving in a Florida bar with a beer. Yeah. I've, always, I've always heard about Guinness and oysters, because a lot of people don't realize Guinness is really lighter than it looks, but I've always had a nice beer and oysters and hot sauce and lemon, and I'll bet that chef would be mortified. Yeah. Um, yes, he would. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send him this podcast and he'll uh, uh, scold oh you. Uh, <laughs> no, he would. Um, well, it's interesting. Um, um, Rowan said that uh, he either he either likes eating oysters um, plain or with like not a squeeze of lemon, but like like a couple drops of lemon. Like if he had like it, he'd, he'd probably prefer like a little eyedropper because uh, he talks about I think this is kind of interesting for wine pairing is uh, like he treats the wine as a sauce like that's his sauce for his uh for his oysters but that's an interesting way to look at it too but yeah he's not like a mignonette person or like just like 
squeeze a half a lemon all over it or um, probably no, probably cocktail sauce never, never touches. He's a purist. Yeah, he's a Horse purist. Radish. I think he wants to, <laughs> yeah, he wants to experience the oyster in sort of its, you know, most pristine, unadorned form. And that's, that's his business and his passion. So, I mean, it's not surprising. Yeah, that's fantastic. I do like the mignonette. That's what I usually am very particular about and what I gravitate to. And I also usually like West Coast oysters over East Coast oysters. But I'm always surprised by every once in a while something I like a little bit better. And I'm like, huh, well, that's out of the mold. But it's always fun to try new ones and uh, and to try new pairings. And sometimes I do get that metallic taste. Yeah. And I'm like, that was not supposed to go like that. <laughs> I guess you got to go with the Guinness. It's the way to go. Yeah, maybe. Maybe yeah. stick with the beer, yeah. right? Or a cocktail or something. Well, let's let's kind of kick it into a new direction. One of the things, Jameson, that our um, listeners have been asking us through social media has been on if, you know, if they're a beginner and they want to start somewhere with wine knowledge, you know, what are some places to start, you know, some tips and because um, it can feel overwhelming. There's so many options, so many references. Do you have some places that you recommend to people who are reading uh, your blogs? Yeah, I mean, a place I would recommend is that uh, I think two of us already mentioned is um, we went to our local wine shop and you, you establish a relationship with someone and you just say, I like this or I'm curious about that. I mean, I think making um, a connection with your with your local wine shop is one of the biggest things you can do in, to increase your knowledge because someone knows what you like and they might say like, um, hey, you like Muscadet. Why don't you try this um, Milan de Bourgogne from um, California? And that's sort of another way you can learn is to, um, you know, go into a, a wine shop or, or, or a wine bar where you do a flight and try like, uh, a grape like Chardonnay from, um, you know, like California, Chablis, and uh, I don't know, like Chile. Or, you know, if you like Cabernet, maybe you might be interested in um, Carmenere as a grape or something like that. Just trying uh, kind of like adjacent grapes. Or if you like Pinot Noir, try a Beaujolais. I think it's that's another good way to learn. Or if you have the option to um, a big vineyard that's really well known, like Bien Nacido in California, like try uh buy a couple of wines made from that vineyard from the same grape same vintage different producers i think that kind of is another way to learn about things but i think that the biggest thing besides i think the biggest thing just starts in the wine shop and going to as many um free or low cost tastings as, as you can because usually the person pouring is either the shop owner or someone who works there is really passionate about wine and then as a bonus it might be uh someone who works for the distributor or importer who's super passionate about it or it may be the winemaker themselves. And um, it's really a, a time to uh, ask questions. And um, it's a great way to learn that doesn't cost a lot of money. And you can try four or five wines or whatever it is for for free or for not a lot of money. And, um, you know, and then just, you know, as a courtesy, I usually try and buy a bottle of wine. Um, but I think to me that those are those are great strategies as far as to kind of make that leap from a beginner to a intermediate wine drinker. I think it's also interesting that you're talking about, you know, when I say organic, an organic place, you're talking about experiencing the wine, a local wine producer or a local wine shop or a local wine bar, because way back in the day when Val started learning about wine, there wasn't a whole lot of internet to be had. There yeah. was no Twitter chat. There was no blogging. There was none of that. We're talking the 90s. And so I was fortunate to move to California and I had... My first two wine books, Wine for Dummies mm -hmm. and Fiona Beckett's Wine Uncorked. Ooh. They were the first two wine books I ever bought just because I did, I, you know, I didn't know. I just right. went and bought the books. Then we would load up a bus with a bunch of lieutenants from my base because I was stationed out in California. Wow. And we would haul it off to Napa and go wine tasting. And then I would just find my way into a store, buy a wine with the, with an, a label that looked interesting and go home and look it up in the book. Like, what's AOC mean? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly what I did with the my book was the wine Bible, uh, Karen McNeil's book. And um, I mean, I started drinking wine in the 90s. And yeah, there was no internet. And there wasn't really a, a wine culture as much as there is now. And I was in um, 
Chicago, so it wasn't like I was, you know, I could go to Napa or anything like that. But yeah, I would do the same thing. I'd like, I'm going to buy a German Riesling and I'm going to go home and flip open to the Riesling section and, and read that. And um, yeah, I mean, that was a great DIY way to learn. I mean, still, I mean, I know Karen just maybe a year or two ago completely revised it. It's like a new book. So to me, that's a great book to start with. I mean, it's called the Wine Bible. I mean, you can't really right, come with that. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think that is a great book to start with. And then Andrea Emmer Robinson, when I first got into wine and actually had Dish Network, she had a show called, I think it was like Simply Wine or something like that. But her book also is really good for beginners too. But I, I think we all have those grassroots sources that we turn to again and again, because sometimes the internet can be very overwhelming, would you say? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's kind of nice to, uh, I mean, you can I'm mean, just Google Cabernet Sauvignon and see what what comes up or Merlot. It's like looking up anything. I mean, it's like a Yelp review. You know, it's like you you get a lot of well, you get a lot of opinions from a lot of people, and and you kind of need to step back and evaluate who is this person, what is their experience, you know, how much how much stock do I take in what they have to say. So yeah, I mean, it's sort of like I mean, it's like a, a blessing and, and a curse in some ways because sometimes what you search for, you're like, I don't know. I've got a million things to read here about Chardonnay, but I don't know not who's quote unquote right. But, you know, what what is this person's background and experience and, and take on it? So, I mean, in some ways, you know, I mean, like, you know, this is from the guy who doesn't want to eat anywhere crowded. Like, in some ways, <laughs> the, you know, the old days were better where you see like, hey, I'm going to go buy the book and I'm going to read the book and I'm going to kind of you know, explore on my own without any uh, social media, you know, chatter about it. So yeah, you're kind of like a, I don't know, like it was like you're on this like island and like I'm at home with my Gruner Vellner and I'm going to read this chapter on it. And like, this is the only way to learn. So yeah, it's kind of, I'm, I'm trying to little get off my lawn. Like I had to work harder to learn about wine back then. I go to the bookstore and buy a book. Yeah. You too. That's hilarious. Well, Steph, because you're like borderline millennial, you're not quite a millennial, but you're almost there. How did you start? Well, I wouldn't say that mine was a whole lot different. I definitely took uh, classes or went to tastings that were just, you know, consumer tastings. And um, I would order flights. I mean, all of the things that you just said were really how I got started. I don't tend to do those things as much anymore. And but that's that's the way that you get more bang for your buck and don't get committed or get too far down some hole that you didn't want to go into in the first place. So, you know, you just kind of start, start that way. But I had a uh, uh, windows on the world book that I thought was really helpful. I also had the wine Bible and I did a lot of studying that way. And I think people, it's still such a good idea to to start with a book because the internet is overwhelming. And, um, and even though I, you know, had more maybe tools when I started, I liked the simplicity of knowing I was looking at a reference that I trusted. And I don't like getting distracted. You know, I think that it's still very much like what you guys said. And um, I still would recommend that too, even with all of the other tools at our fingertips. Jameson hit on it while while he was talking that made me think it can be overwhelming to look at a bunch of information that pops up on your computer screen, where if you're simply just tasting something and then putting your nose in the book, there's some kind of active learning happening there where you're not just trying to jam knowledge into your brain. You're experiencing the wine you're reading about it, or you're, you know, at a tasting, and you're learning a little bit of about it, you're probably going to actually learn more versus just, you know, being able to regurgitate facts on something. Would you say, Jameson? Yeah, uh, I agree. I think it's, uh, you know, and and something I didn't mention was definitely taking classes. I mean, that's how I learned a lot from uh, the Chicago wine school is where I first started taking wine classes. And the nice thing about classes is, um, you know, I mean, they're not cheap, but you're, getting to taste a lot of wines in a very focused manner. And this was a, this was a super relaxed classroom environment. It was, you know, it usually, it usually became kind of a party towards the end, uh, intentionally. <laughs> but, um, like, when are you going to really buy, like, I don't know, like 15 bottles of Cabernet, you know, Napa Cabernet or, uh, white wines from France, you know, like, like, oh, I'm just going to buy a case of mixed case of Loire Valley, uh, white wines and, you know, go home and learn about it. So I think taking classes is a really great way. And it's really nice. I mean, you're sitting at a, you're sitting in a chair, 
you've got plenty of space. You got space to write, taste. You've got your spit cups and buckets, and uh, it's it's better than sort of like fighting your way through a crowd at a, a event too. Being it's nice being seated and having someone pour for you or just passing the bottles around. So I think that kind of experiential learning is 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 really helpful yeah you read my mind because i was sitting there thinking you know like the the festivals and stuff like that where it's hot and the wine's getting hot and yeah don't don't touch me right and don't spill your wine on me is really yeah. oh yeah. my gosh the pusher uppers the puller outers we've <laughs> talked about that before that never gets old when you say that val i always snicker yeah, I think it was like dear wine buyer, you know, people that push the glass up yep. to keep you from pouring and pull their glass away and spill it and yep. and all that. Nobody what you know, yeah. But you know what I think is interesting is how you mentioned also that you are a staunch defender of the champagne flute. I am. I'm the only one. I'm on an island. So other than the fact that it is sexy and we think it's festive, but we, uh, you know, I, I'm actually somebody that prefers a, a wine glass for my, my champagne, depending Ooh. on the price. But I want to hear you defend the flute, yeah, man, well, because we have, we do have a listener and I know for a fact we have listeners who love the flute. Good. Well, I love them. There are a couple things I want to say. First of all, I think the part of the uh, undeniable charm of champagne is seeing it is the bubbles are the bubbles and seeing them that cascading uh sort of like torrent of bubbles in a flute is unmatched you don't get that in a bowl um like when i get champagne and white wine glass frankly it goes flat pretty quick i love the uh, you know like the elegance of it the you know i'm gonna say sexiness of it uh yeah. it's and it's sort of like hypnotizing in a way um and i also think when you walk into um when you walk into a room or a restaurant and uh or a wine bar and you see a bunch of people having you know drinking champagne out of a flute it's like you're like they're celebrating it doesn't mean they're celebrating an event they could be celebrating tuesday but there's something really festive about it i also feel like i i'm not i don't buy the science that uh it stifles the aromas at all uh i feel that like um part of the uh the, the sparkling nature of it and the the movement of of bubbles you know pushing up like pushes aromas so why wouldn't you want like more like something that's like a uh, tube shaped device to deliver uh aromas to your olfactory system it just to me it makes more sense like um like to inhale something you're gonna inhale it through uh, a tube more powerfully than through a bowl so uh that's another reason why i like it and i'm just kind of um i feel like the uh the worst of the internet like you're doing it wrong type of articles. Uh, a lot of them are, here's why you're drinking champagne wrong. Uh, I think it's a real, I think there's a lot of snobbery involved in it. I've definitely dealt with some Psalms who are like, you know, like we don't, we don't serve it in flutes. We don't have flutes. You can't have it in a flute. Uh, you're stifling the aromas. You're ruining your experience. I think it's a, a misguided, um, not, a, it should be a customer first uh, profession. And I think the, all the best Psalms would agree that if, you want to drink it out of a flute, I will provide you with a flute and I'll be happy to do that. Uh, it's just, to me, it's also, it, it's sort of a distasteful side of, of wine that you know, everyone's like, oh, we're demystifying wine or, you know, we're unsnobbifying it. And I think, um, I think looking down on the flute is, um, a mistake and it's the way I, I just, I don't want to drink flat champagne. I mean, to me, the, the most special thing about bubbles is a uh, champagne is, is, are the bubbles, uh, obviously the flavor, it's delicious too. But I mean, look, champagne producers spend a lot of time and money getting those bubbles in the bottle. And the first thing you do is pour it out in a giant, you know, red burgundy glass. And it's like flat in a minute. Like to me, that's that's not fun. Well, that's actually the defense that it's more tactile when you have, like I said, I have these long, sexy flutes that I love. But again, if it's a really expensive start of champagne, I want to experience it probably because I'm always in study mode. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what you said makes me think about when I see those articles, you're drinking bourbon wrong. Here's oh. why you're drinking whiskey. I don't click on those articles, yeah. man. I don't want anybody telling me that what I like is wrong. So even though I might have a preference for this glass, yeah. I usually don't say the champagne flute is wrong because I have quite the selection of them in my home. But at the same time, you know, having a preference for the flute or having a preference for the glass, there's nothing wrong with having a preference for either there are points to be made for whatever it is. If you want to drink it in a red solo cup, have a nut, you know, mm -hmm. but 
at the same time, I agree with you so much on those articles that say, here's why you're drinking your whiskey wrong. Mm -hmm. To this day, I've never read any of those articles because I think, don't tell me what I'm doing yeah. wrong. I'll drink whiskey however the hell I yeah, want. Yeah, it's the worst of clickbait. It is. Steph, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I thought that was a very good defense. and Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, and what I also hadn't realized... But when you were talking about walking into a room when, you know, people are drinking um, champagne out of, sh out of the flute and you're starting to make an association of, you know, oh, like they're having fun, they're celebrating something. And, you know, maybe you start to have an emotional response about it. And I hadn't really ever thought about that before. But I think, you know, there is a cue that, you know, emotionally that that you're you know what's going on there. And the glassware is the cue because if they were all just drinking out of regular white wine glasses, there would be actually nothing that you would be thinking about. You know, you just would walk by. And so yeah. I thought that was kind of an interesting thought because it does sort of separate it out uh, from the rest of the pack. But the other thing is that last night, or yesterday afternoon, I have to admit I did some more day drinking, but I had a friend over and I opened a bottle of kava and I was pouring it into our Riesling glasses. And after, I don't know, 30 minutes or something, I'm like, why is this so flat? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, and even though I know it would become flat, I just was sort of disappointed. And then I was like, oh. And when I heard you talking about that, I thought, you know, there is there is a lot to defend, I think. But I have mixed feelings about it all because I too, I do like, I'm obsessed with swirling and I do like mm -hmm. to get, you know, my nose really into the glass. So uh, there's two sides to this, you know. I don't think they're sides. I just think they're preferences. And yeah. on some occasions, I'm I'm breaking out the flutes. And then on other occasions, I'm breaking out the wine glasses. I think it depends what I'm pouring, what the occasion is, what the mood. I think the bottom line is you have to pick your adventure. Yeah. Choose, and choose your own your experience. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, you know, when you go skiing, I don't know. Do you ski, Jameson? Uh, I used to ski a lot. I was actually a, a ski bum in Utah for two years. Nice. Right. So I didn't learn till I was in my mid thirties and I actually haven't been in about 12 years. But what I did learn was skiing was not so much a sport. It was an experience. You know, you've got to have that Bloody Mary before the slopes or you've got to, you know, you, you got to hang out and do the ski bum thing. And, you know, you got to have the beer after and then the snuggle. You know, there's a, there's a whole meal and, and drink thing that goes with skiing for me. And yeah, pray, ski. it's an ex it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, a pray, ski. It's an experience. It's not something I was ever good at, but it was something I did to have the whole experience. I wanted the meditation of linking my turns and swishing down a slope, but then I wanted all of the stuff that went with it. And when you're drinking your champagne or whatever sparkling wine you're drinking, whatever that is, then you get to choose your adventure. You get to have, if you want a snuggler afterwards or you want to have whatever it is, then you have to choose what makes you happy. And I think that's what we try to get across on this show is it's not wrong. It's your preference. Mm -hmm. By the way, what is a snuggler? <laughs> oh, the snuggler is a hot chocolate with peppermint schnapps in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like what you drink before you go out and have the beer and sit around the fire pit later. But just one of those things that I learned, you know, that I always had to have after skiing. And then I would start with the beer and then the dinner for the rest of the night. So, again, that was my ski experience. Somebody yeah. else might be going, oh, God, Val. But hey, shut up. I drink my oysters with beer. <laughs> <laughs> Fry. Oh, that's good. Okay. Now we know what uh, what Val is uh, doing on her ski trips. But um, I think we if this is the time, Jameson, for uh -huh. uh, the embarrassing wine story to be unleashed. We ask okay. all of our guests the same question. Oh, look, I'm out of time. I actually have to go. I have a, a meeting. Um, no, I thought about, um, I, okay, so I thought about this. I took, a, I took dating advice from a master sommelier. Uh oh. And, uh oh. That's um, your embarrassing wine story? Does well, it end right then? <laughs> well, no, actually. So <clears throat> what this person told me, so I was telling, I was telling him, it was a man, I was telling him about um, this date I had in Seattle with somebody who I had a crush on for a long time and I finally got to go out with them and just like, I don't know, just, I didn't get a second date. And he's like, where did you go? And I said, oh, we went to this new like 
Cider Bar and Ballard, this, you know, neighborhood in Seattle. And it's like all this place with like, you know, like this like reclaimed wood bar and like all, you know, all this. It was like super Seattle, Pacific Northwest precious. And he was like, he was like, that was your mistake. Like, don't go somewhere so stuffy on your first date. He was like, go to like a dive bar where you can both relax and just like drink cheap beer. And I was like, oh, that's, that sounds like actually some pretty good advice. So actually I did, um, the next, uh, the next date I went on, I suggested this, uh, you know, kind of divey bar in Capitol Hill, this neighborhood I went to. And actually this person and I had a great time and just had cheap drinks and we ended up dating for, you know, a few months after that. So I don't know if that's embarrassing, but, uh, I guess maybe just taking dating advice from master Psalms. I don't know. They're, they're, Hey, master Psalms, they're people too. They have a life experience outside of wine. So, um, I thought it was yeah. interesting that uh, a person who's a master sommelier and you think they'd be like, my advice is to, you know, open up a, you know, Grand Cru Chablis and, uh, you know, like oysters and whatever. And he was like, hey, go to go to a dive bar and drink cheap beer and just relax, man. So yeah. it's good wine advice, I think, too, just, you know, not to uh, freak out about it and just kind of relax and live in the moment. No, I think that's a good story. And I think most of the master psalms we know are super cool. And that's true. <laughs> yeah. Like that's you said, true. they're yeah. people too. And right. <laughs> and they all have their own embarrassing wine stories too. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, well, that's a good story. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. I love talking about uh, my dating failures. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. No, we've had we've had some doozies on this show. That's okay. But well, what's next for you? I'm just kind of curious. So to just kind of get off the topics yeah. of failure. Let's talk about success. Like, is there <laughs> right. anything? That's a good segue. Yeah. Any right? Thank you. Yeah. So anything you want to tease or full on plug about what's next for Jameson Fink? Well, I'm, I've had a couple. Um, you know, I'm doing some freelance writing, and I have a couple. Uh, you know, bigger projects in the pipeline that uh, you'll be hearing about. I guess the best way is to um. Uh, just follow me on, uh, I mean, Instagram at Jamison Fink and my blog is, uh, jamisonfink.com. So I'm just sort of, uh, I'm kind of open to everything and exploring any opportunities. I mean, whether they're here in New York or in California or Oregon or I don't know, anyone in the world. If someone wants to send me to Tasmania to live for the rest of my life. I would totally do that. So, uh, oh, yeah. uh, yeah, I've got all my options open and, um, I did, I guess I'll plug, um, I just had my first article for Vine Pair come out today. It's about rosé and more about how everyone loves rosé, but they just want to drink that uh, super pale uh, Provencal style rosé. Um, I know there's a lot of diversity in rosé in Provence, of course, and all over France and all over the world. But that uh, sort of the challenge of getting people to be like, try a Tavel or try a oh, rosé yeah. that's got some you know deeper hue and a little more weight to it uh, that's still refreshing and delicious so that was a pretty interesting topic to explore and i talked to uh people retailers and uh a couple psalms and some winemakers um all over all over the country you know east coast west coast uh middle of the country as well so it'll be interesting to see what kind of comments people have on that or what i don't know what your thoughts are and a full confession the, the rosé i'm drinking is like practically like see it's see-through it's like almost like water but it's delicious so there's that yeah I, you know, I think I'm like you when it comes to rosé. I like a nice range. I, I, I'm, I'm always marveling at the different colors. You know, one thing we can agree upon, it's not all sweet. It's not all blush. Yep. It's not all sticky. It's not all Kool-Aid or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It's diverse. Just like all red wines don't taste the same. All white wines are not the same. All rosé wines are not the same. It's not a flavor. Yeah, preach it. I hear you. Preach it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Steph? This has been so fun. I wish we could like hang out and drink rosé next week. <laughs> I, I'm uh, my next week's pretty free. <laughs> Wait, when is your article on Vine Pear coming out? It just came out today, like uh, earlier today. Oh, it's good. Live. Okay, so we'll link that up too, so people can check right. that out on our um, blog that goes along with this episode. Fantastic. And we want a picture too of what you were drinking. Yeah, I'll send you. I'll definitely send you a photo. You got it. All right. Well, cool. Thank you so much. And please uh, keep in touch and let us know anything that's new coming uh, your way. Yeah. Thank you, Val and Steph. It was great speaking to both of you. I had an awesome time. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. And if you're in Colorado, come see us. Okay. I will. Yeah, definitely. Definitely give us a heads up or wherever you go next. Let us know because we do 
I mean, we've, we've done the Seattle thing. We'll be in, we'll actually be up in the Finger Lakes in August Ooh. for the Society of Wine Educators. So if you have to find your way up there, like I said, keep in touch and we'd love to see what you, what you're on to next. Okay. Well, thank you both very much. Well, that was so much fun. And we cannot thank Jameson enough for drinking with us today. <laughs> I know he was so great. It really, you know, awesome. if we if we could just wishful thinking, but like be all together, that would have been like the perfect uh, day drinking, uh, get to know Jameson and get to know the Wine 25 ladies. I think that's one of the things, though, full confession, I was listening to his podcast quite a few years back and he was doing an episode about red wines and he had a woman on there who didn't like red wines. And so he poured all these red wines for her. One of them, I think, was a Beaujolais. One was, I think, a Lambrusco. And just pretty much what we were talking about, choose your adventure. Yeah. And just kind of showing her that all red wine doesn't come in the same flavor. And I was like, that's a good personality. Yeah. So we kind of had a glimpse into his fun, no wine snobbery side. And then if you've read his blog. So so we knew that he was going to be a good guest. We didn't know he'd be a great guest. He was awesome. Yeah. And his blog reads a lot like this interview. I mean, his personality really shines, I think, with his blog and stuff. So his writing is very fun to read. Yeah. So we'll hook you up with all those kind of links. And uh, you know what? We also want to thank you for hooking us up with our newest iTunes reviews. I mean, big, big, big thanks to In Love With Dana's five-star review titled Great Show About Wine. Who doesn't love to learn more about wine? This has really developed into a great informative show. I have bought different wine based on their recommendations. That's an awesome review. We love that we're inspiring you to go out and buy great bottles and that you're learning and that you're enjoying the content. So again, choose your adventure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you so much in love with Dana. Yes. And thank you to our patrons. Our Reserva Superiore supporter, Robin Sauls from Girls Gone Grape. Our Reserva supporter, Auntie in Georgia. Our Tenacious Tasters, Jeff E. from the award-winning We Like Drinking podcast. Sebastian of Sassy Italy Tours. Jen in Maryland. David and Lisa in Illinois. Anne-Marie in Virginia. Our It's Not 5 O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners. Meg in South Dakota. Clay in Arizona. John, Andrew, and Aswani in California. Chantel in Ontario, Mary Lou in Pennsylvania, Kathy in Georgia, Chris, Janet, and Diane in Colorado, Steve and Renee in Illinois, Kathy in Tennessee, Ashley in North Carolina, and Sean in Ohio, who we were going to see, I think, right, at the wine camp. Uh, yes. Yes. Wine, wine camp. camp. Yay. Yes, that's so exciting. Wine camp. I always think of Wayne's World. What? Wine camp, wine camp, party time. Excellent. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> Sorry, it's stuck That's in so my head. That's so funny. I've never heard you say that, nor do I think of that. <laughs> and I don't know why I do, but I also want to thank our tastemaker listeners, David in Scotland, Carol in Kentucky, Karen in California, Chip and Katie in Pennsylvania, Danielle, and Serena in New York. And you too can go to our Patreon page for details on how to be entered into our monthly drawing exclusive content and get some swag. And on our website, windofive.com, you can shop with our affiliates for books, art, travel, gifts, clubs, the whole thing, and watch that space for some new stuff coming very, very soon. Yes. In between the episodes, we are on the social spaces at Wine25, and you can find us Actually, you can find one another on the Wine25 community page on Facebook. So that's kind of fun to interact with other listeners privately. If you would like to connect with Val personally, she is on Twitter at WineGalUnboxed. And as Vina with Val everywhere else, I am online as the Wine Heroine. So until next week, cheers! Thank you for listening to the Wine25 podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5 and tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips.